What is up, my Squirtleites? It is I, your king, and today I want to give you my impressions on Horizon Forbidden West. Now, obviously, this game has only been out for a couple of days, so the level of spoilers is at mega... Um, I, you know what? I didn't actually think of a, an analogy for this, but it's at an insane level where it is so easy for me to spoil something for anybody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to completely avoid story and plot elements in this game. I am only going to show gameplay of me fighting machines. Yes, a couple of them will be new machines for sure, but I'll show gameplay of me fighting machines, climbing a tall neck, mostly just stuff that is entirely indistinguishable from Zero Dawn. I won't be going to any of the major settlements. I won't be having any, any interactions with characters, any major dialogue, none of that stuff, just to avoid the spoilers, okay? I promise it's going to be as squeaky clean as possible. I just want to talk about the improvements made between Zero Dawn and this game. Now, I am playing this on PlayStation 5. I do not have a fancy gaming monitor or OLED TV, so therefore I have not played this game at all in the graphics mode. I've only been playing it in performance mode. I tried graphics mode out for like a minute. And aside from it dropping the game to 30 frames a second, I noticed zero tangible difference in terms of the visual fidelity whatsoever. But again, I think that's because my TV can't actually take advantage of it. So I've been playing on performance mode so I can get that sweet 60 frames a second. This is an action game after all. 60 frames a second is kind of important. I obviously can't speak to the fidelity of the PS4 version either, so... I guess on that note, while I'm still talking about graphics, let's talk about one of the biggest improvements that Horizon Forbidden West makes over Zero Dawn and kind of harkens back to what a lot of people's biggest criticism was of Zero Dawn in terms of its visuals. So both games are ridiculously good looking. Let's not beat around the bush. They are phenomenal looking. Zero Dawn running on a PS4 Pro with HDR effects looks not much worse than this game. It's actually pretty fantastic for a five-year-old game. I mean, the way the games are now, you know, games that came out six, seven years ago. Uncharted 4 A Thieves' End is still one of the best looking games of all time. And that came out before Horizon Zero Dawn. Obviously, there's not going to be a huge difference in that regard, but Forbidden West does look good. That said, the biggest problem people had with Zero Dawn in terms of its visuals was character animations. Particularly in one-on-one -on -one -on -one dialogue situations. Facial animations, the way that eyes were moving around, the way that lips were flapping about, a lot of that stuff looked very robotic and unnatural in Horizon Zero Dawn, and it got a lot of criticism for it. Now, me personally, I wasn't super bothered by it. Like Granted, I've played games like Fallout 4 where it looks even uglier, and it still doesn't bother me there either. For me, I mostly care about what's being said and how it's being said in those sorts of engagements. And Horizon Zero Dawn mostly got it right. There were a couple of characters where the voice acting wasn't that great, but for the most part, it was good. The dialogue was written pretty darn well. I never really had a problem with it. Now, that being said, I still think that the story was better than the characters, but I'll talk about more of that in a bit. However, in Horizon Zero Dawn's DLC, The Frozen Wilds, these animations were improved significantly. There was a very tangible difference in terms of the way that the characters moved, their way their eyes moved. Again, all that same stuff I mentioned before. It looked a little bit more natural. Now, Forbidden West takes what Frozen Wilds was trying to do and just brings it to a whole nother level. It looks so much better than this game. There is still a little bit of stilted animation here and there, but you kind of have to look for it more in this game. For the most part, there's a lot more fluidity to the way that characters are moving around and the way that they're looking, the way their eyes work. Honestly, the only two times where I really had a problem with it, I think it was a glitch. I don't even think it was it was supposed to be that way. Because I do know, and I've heard reports, that there are a couple of facial glitches in the game at the moment. And I think that's what those were, because those seemed very out of place, and otherwise I haven't run into those issues before or since. So... Yeah, th the characters look a lot more natural and a lot better. The voice acting, on top of that, by the way, while we're on that subject, is markedly improved. Um, and I actually don't think it's necessarily the acting itself. I think it's actually more the voice direction. There's just something in the way that the conversations are happening now that just feels just spot on. Like, there was so much more care given to that this time around, as well as the writing. The writing does feel a little bit better and more on point for the characters you meet, as well as for Aloy herself. Now, that being said, probably the biggest criticism I've had with Aloy as a character between... And, and, and mind you, I'm, I'm still not going to talk about story or plot stuff. This is just kind of the dialogue and the actual... The way that the game is written. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to try to focus on without talking about plot elements. But Aloy herself, 
when when I first played Zero Dawn, I did not like her very much, at least for the first several hours. It took a while for her to grow on me, and, and a lot of that had to do with the way that the plot progressed, but at first, I did not like her. I found her to be kind of annoying. I didn't really like the way that she was presented. She seemed kind of, in some ways, a little bit stereotypical, but over time, she grew on me more, and she kind of cemented herself as her own character a bit better, and I actually really like her now. In Forbidden West, I still feel the same, but my biggest criticism with her is she has one really big protagonist problem across both games where she talks to herself a lot. She'll do something, she'll pick up an item, she'll fight an enemy or see an enemy or just, you know, the most minute, inconsequential things and she'll comment on it. In Zero Dawn, it got a little annoying, but it wasn't like the worst thing ever. She would, know, she would shut up after a while, she'd comment on something and then she wouldn't mention it again for you know, another 30, 45 minutes. Forbidden West, it feels like that restraint wasn't, isn't there as much. She seems to flap her gums a bit more this time around, which I will say could get a little bit grating for some people. So do keep that in mind. She's still an awesome character, and in the actual dialogue exchanges and the cutscenes, she's still excellent. She does have a bit of a problem with asking too many questions. Again, protagonist syndrome. She's got to, she's got to lead every quest, uh, every bit of dialogue with a question so that we can they can frame it better but aside from that she's still really really well done and i feel like she's even further cementing herself into the character that she is and taking charge of her own personality which i do like i still think she's great i do that being said let's talk about the other characters in the game real quick since we're kind of on that subject now in Zero Dawn, I have to say, the only characters by the end of the game that I was interested in was, well, obviously Aloy was one, she eventually grew on me, but the only other two characters that stuck out to me in that game was Silence, voiced by Lance Reddick, who was pretty much the most important character in the entire main plot, aside from Aloy herself, and then Erend, who was like Aloy's partner in crime, the guy that you would run into the most throughout the game for various reasons. Once you got to, like, the like a third into the game he was the most common reoccurring character period and those two were great everybody else was pretty forgettable i mean outside of the actual events of the main plot itself and even then some of the people in there were not that great either but outside of that a lot of characters were very unmemorable one note i don't think they got enough uh they got enough progression and they got enough characterization to make themselves interesting Forbidden West does not have that problem at all. Oh my gosh, they have significantly improved that aspect of the game a ton. Like, Zero Dawn, the characters weren't that great. The story was amazing. I can't speak for the story yet now in Forbidden West, but the characters are fantastic. There's a character, in fact, in this game that is a reoccurring character from the first game that I was not very much into because I didn't think that they got a lot of spotlight or a lot of focus or enough to make me care about them. I'm only, like I said, I'm 12 hours into the game, which again is not a lot and I'll explain why in a bit, but they, I, every time I see them, I want to see more of them because of how much they've improved the way that they've handled them, how much they've improved the the face-to-face -face dialogue with Aloy, the, the interactions with them, and they've made them so much more personable and interesting and likable. And I love that, and this doesn't just have to do with major characters. Even the most minor, inconsequential characters seem better than others. There's still a couple of, like, super obscure side characters that were kind of eh, whatever. But there's a lot of them that it's like, oh my gosh, one conversation, and I will go to the ends of the earth for you to help you. Like, you, I love you. You are great. And I can't talk about these quests, obviously, and I won't talk about these quests, but they have just... They have so improved these characters, and they have made these side quests so much more interesting as a result. I actually like just sitting down and listening and going through all of the dialogue options, which I, I will say, they have also improved in that area too. There's a lot more dialogue options in this game. In Horizon Zero Dawn, you would really only get dialogue options when talking with the more major characters in either the main quest or the more important side quests. The, the less important minor side quests and the errands that you ran, those didn't really have dialogue options as much. For the most part, it would just be like to get a little extra bit of a bite of information and that was it. This time around, it feels like every single character has multiple paths of dialogue options that you, uh, as long as there's somebody that is quest important in any, in any way at all. And I love that. I really do. I think that they are getting that element of the game down so freaking well. This is probably the biggest wealth of dialogue options I've seen outside of an RPG ever. It's really impressive in that regard. And yeah, I, I think that Gorilla really got this right. Now, that being said, I wanted to mention real quick, why is 12 hours not 
all that much in the grand scheme of things. Well, Zero Dawn had about a how was that about a two to three hour prologue before you were loosed into the open world forbidden west does something similar obviously not in the same way at all but it does something similar where you aren't quite able to just break out and go do whatever you want for quite some time forbidden west however though it's more like six to seven hours before you hit that point which some people might go that's like the length of an entire game and you're right now that's to say not to say that that six to seven hours isn't enjoyable it's not like it's all a tutorial no it's not it's more of a taster it's and again like how zero dawn did it it's more of a taster it's more of like a small open world before you get into the big open world and just to kind of get your feet wet and understand all of the mechanics as you go in without it necessarily being a tutorial the game isn't like saying okay now you're going to go do this because this is how you're going to learn how to do this blah 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 no it's just like here's a small part of the map explore it to your heart's content so that when you get to the bigger map, you don't feel completely lost and alienated, which I like that, I have to say. It's not like an Assassin's Creed where you're just like, well, you did a trailing mission, here's the open world with like 7 billion icons on it, good luck! It, 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 that's not how this game works, not at all. It's got a much more natural progression and structure to the way that it works, but again, it does take a while to hit the point where you're fully out there and able to go at your own leisure, which... I don't actually think it is a bad thing, but maybe some people might go, oh no, that's too daunting. I think that is probably where my biggest criticism with this game lies so far. I am, and, I, and again, again, I can't speak to it with any sort of confidence, but so far, I am getting the impression that this game might be a little bit too big. Which to some people, you might go, great, but these days with how many open world games there are and how big they be and how big they strive to be, this game may have taken it a little too far. I don't want to. I don't want to speak too soon, but I am a little bit worried that this game might be a bit too bloated for its own good. It remains to be seen. Anyway, last thing I want to talk about, in my opinion, the most important subject to talk about with a game like this, especially because it's the whole reason I like Zero Dawn so much, is the combat, the gameplay itself, the way that you actually play it, and how you play it. That is to me what makes Zero Dawn such a special game. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Horizon Zero Dawn was my game of the year in 2017. And not only was it my game of the year in 2017, if you were to pick amongst all of the PS4's exclusives, it would probably be my number one. I liked it that much. It was a very, very good game that took what is a very standard, very safe, very overdone open world formula and tweaked enough things right to make it a very fresh experience and take it above and beyond any other open world game and a lot of that has to do with the gameplay the actual act of fighting the machines is so freaking cool it's to me horizon zero dawn is what i want a monster hunter game to be i know people like monster hunter i don't like the actual mechanics of fighting monsters in monster hunter very much i much prefer the way that i fight monsters in horizon zero dawn that is like perfect to me in that regard that or shadow of the colossus those are those are like the two ways that i would like to do it the very combat focused puzzle solving mechanics that are less about build crafting and more about just strategizing and performing in the moment that's what i like in a game where you kill big monsters now forbidden west is actually better in that regard a lot better oh my gosh it improves so much and it was honestly they didn't do much to improve it a ton. There's in fact one key change that they made that I think fixes this entire game's combat system. Now, before I get into it though, I want to warn you guys, Forbidden West is more difficult than Zero Dawn, by quite a bit actually. I'm playing on the normal difficulty, which is what I always do before I jump into a hard difficulty on a subsequent playthrough. I always like to start with normal to see what the baseline is, what most people are going to experience for this game and see how easy or hard that is before I tweak things. Especially when I'm planning to do a let's play of the game like I am now. I always want to see what is the normal experience going to be for everybody else and how do I stack up against that. Normal mode in this is harder than normal mode in Zero Dawn and it's not even close. Zero Dawn, I think I died in combat situations on that difficulty once. Like, without screwing around. Like, I think I actually legitimately died in a fight that was too big for my britches one time. And even then, I was still figuring out what the game was. I, I was new to me. I had never played a game like this before. I still didn't know all of its quirks and its ins and outs yet. 
with Forbidden West, I know how this game works. I've played the entire first game four times over. I know how this game works. I've died three times already. Like I said, I'm only 12 hours in. This game does not pull any punches. And a large part of that has to do with, again, one specific change that they made to the combat system that fixes not everything, but almost everything. And that change is nerfing the melee combat. Let me explain. In Horizon Zero Dawn, your melee, your spear that you had, had two forms of attack. A light attack and a heavy attack. Otherwise, it was also your stealth kill option. But when you were in the heat of battle, you used a light attack or a, melee att or a heavy melee attack. Excuse me. Light attacks were for doing quick, successive chip damage. This was the best way of dealing with human enemies. Heavy attacks could either one-shot a weaker human enemy or even a weaker machine or at the very least knock them over so you could then perform a critical strike which would almost certainly finish them off after the fact. The only creatures this didn't work on were the absolute strongest and biggest creatures. Pretty much everything past like hour six of the game was where you would start to really run into creatures that could survive that stuff. But even then, if they got up close and personal, you could give them a few whacks and it would do quite a bit of damage. In Forbidden West, that is not the case at all. In this game, your spear sucks at dealing with machines, and against human enemies, it's incredibly important, but there's a lot more nuance to it. You actually have a combo system, and you need to learn specific moves with it and specific combos to actually deal certain amounts of damage to certain enemies. You also have to use it to knock off things like their armor so you can actually start to do significant amounts of damage. It's very important, and it's also got a parry system in there, and you have to worry about dodging and things like that. It's not near as easy to outright kill human enemies with your melee as it was in the first game, and it's definitely not as easy to kill machines. For instance, the first machine that you would encounter in Zero Dawn took one heavy attack to kill. Outright. One heavy attack. In this game, it's like six heavy attacks, and doing that many heavy attacks is really going to leave you exposed and open for a lot of damage from the creatures. Just, it's just not a good idea. You use the melee combat either as a defense mechanism or you use it against people. That's pretty much it, and this is good because you could rely on the melee combat way too much in Zero Dawn. In Zero Dawn, they did give you a wealth of weapons to pick from as far as like you know stuff that isn't your spear. But I, my gosh, I stuck to the same four with an optional fifth one the entire time. If you watch my Let's Play of Horizon Zero Dawn, you'll notice that. Stuff like the Warbow and the Tripcaster and the Rattler, I never, ever used those things because they just felt so superfluous to me. They just didn't have a point or a place in my loadout. All I used was the standard bow, mostly for, well, the, obviously the regular arrows were for hunting animals, and then the fire arrows for being able to deal fire damage at a distance that the sling couldn't reach. I would use the sharp shot bow for all of my extra damage, for doing the most damage to actual machines and people, for getting those headshots, for the most accurate long distance shots, as well as for tear blast arrows so I could strip components off with ease. I would use the sling for all of my elemental damage, and then I would use the rope caster for tying things down. That's basically it. The only thing I would sometimes switch out for was the blast sling so I could get more raw damage in in medium to close ranges. Uh, without trying to line up my shots like I did with the sharp shot, but, but that was it. That was all I ever used in that game as long as I had the ability to. I mean, the the new weapon type that was introduced in Frozen Wilds, I tried to make that work, and uh, it just, it, it wasn't, I, it never clicked with me all that much. I, I really just kind of stuck to the same stuff because I could use those four or melee combat, and that's it. That's all I ever needed. The corruption element was almost pointless, too. It, just, it felt like it was never needed, and it felt like it was way too much to actually try to make it work. Fire damage, with its damage over time, was so strong, and if I didn't use fire damage or something was resistant to fire damage, I'd just use ice damage, because then it just made my arrows do double damage. I mean, that's really all I ever had to worry about in terms of elements. In Forbidden West, because they have taken away your viability with melee weapons, they have made worrying about the weaknesses and the strengths of enemies is so much more vital. Even on the weakest critters in the game, you have to be so much more careful and strategic with the way that you approach combat situations, weighing whether or not you want to go in headlong or you want to use stealth. I think that was a huge boon to this game's combat system because it does have a lot of depth to it. It's just that when any combat system has a lot of depth and you have an alternative means of breaking it in half, you're obviously going to use the means to break it in half. And so far, I haven't had that means. I haven't found something yet that allows me to break it in half just yet. Obviously, there might be something like that down the road, but for right now, I do feel like each fight is a lot more meaningful. I don't feel like I can breeze through packs of machines 
without a second thought. I actually have to be careful approaching every situation, even when the weakest of critters are there. And I like that. I like that a lot. I think it was a very nice change. It does, however, come at the cost of doing a lot more build crafting in that regard. You have to worry about, and I know I just said build crafting isn't a part of Horizon Zero. It technically is but not in the same way as like a Monster Hunter where you do all of that before you depart on your expedition, blah, 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 before you set up. No, it's more of a dynamic fluid system where you're, it's, it's, I'm talking about like upgrading your weapons and improving things and making sure you have the right weapons on hand, which is also mostly stuff that you can do on the fly. The upgrading, yes, you need to be in major settlements and stuff like that. But for the most part, you just, it's a dynamic process of, oh, I'm approaching a pack. All these things are weak to frost. Therefore, time to use frost damage. That's really it. Uh, but you do have to, like, worry about what types of weapons you're carrying. There, there seems to be an emphasis this time around about carrying multiples of the same kind of weapon to get different jobs done. Uh, in the first game, like, you had the bow and the long distance bow, and the element bow, and the element sling, and the boom sling, and the shotgun, which was the rattler. I mean, you had very broad ranges of jobs assigned to one specific weapon. If you needed to take care of an element, you had a weapon, and you would use that for the rest of the game. That was all you ever needed. This game, it's not so simple. You actually have to switch things in and out you have to make uh, decide what's going to work better for you you also have to just worry about your preferences what kind of weapon gets this job done but you actually like more than the other i have encountered multiple different kinds of blast weapons this time around which in the first game there was only one and one of the new ones that i found i actually prefer to using a sling and it's you know things like that also add a lot to the combat system and again i think it's handled very very well but i don't want to spoil too much i don't want to say too much about this game at least not yet. I have said before, and I will say it again, I'm intending to beat this entire game, and then I'm going to be launching into a Let's Play with it. And that will be the perfect time to get my full thoughts out there and explain a lot more about this game because, oh man, there's so much to talk about. This game is shaping up to be a good one. There's a very well possibility it ends up being my game of the year of 2022. We will see, but of course, I have a lot of game ahead of me. So guys, thank you all so very much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.